Um, only claim to fame in the world is that I, I was the person that created the Microsoft GitHub account. Like everything else is a big team effort. That's about the only thing I can point to. But yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting journey to be on. Um, speaking of journeys, I thought it'd be good today, rather than me talk about technology and, you know, blah, blah, dot net, blah, blah, DevOps and things like that, I thought we'd kick off this morning with just a quick look back at history. Um, we don't have a crystal ball. We, we can't tell what's going to happen in the future, but we can very much use history to um, show us what's likely to happen based on what's happened in the past. And um, it's a very important story that happened locally as well. So I wanted to really, let's learn what we can learn about DevOps by looking back to uh, an important revolution from the Industrial Revolution. My name's Martin Woodward, Martin Wu at Microsoft.com if you want to send me an email. Um, at Martin Woodward for all your abuse on Twitter. I will be posting some links and things to some books and some stories and stuff about this after, the, after the, uh, today. So do follow me if you want to get those. And then I work on uh, the DevOps side at Visual Studio now. So this is, um, yeah, as, uh, let me say, as I, said, I live in a field in uh, rural Northern Ireland, just in Randallstown. So just head up the motorway. When you get to the end of the motorway, turn right and that's me. Um, I live there. I actually work over in Seattle, building 18 is where my team is. I'm, a re I'm classed as a remote employee, um, which is fine. We, we have you know, this thing called Skype nowadays, works quite well. Uh, and it's, it's good fun and it's great to be able to do all this stuff and be here in a field in Northern Ireland. As you can tell, I, I'm, I'm not a local lad, I'm married into the country, um, but it's, it's great to be able to be here, stay in Northern Ireland, stay in the place I love, bring the kids up in the best place in the world to bring kids up and still be able to uh, do cool stuff with a cool company. I work on the DevOps side of Visual Studio Team Services, so we do all the Git stuff and blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's as much of the product pitch as you're gonna get today. I'm, I'm an engineer, not a, not a marketeer, as you'll be able to tell. Right, I work from home. The, the most annoying thing when you work from home in a field is internet, as you'll agree. Now recently I moved from my DSL connection to a 4G connection. And I've got wicked bandwidth now. I get like, you know, 50, 60 meg down, about 30 meg up, which is so much better than it was before. So I love 4G. Um, however, my ping times were annoying me because it's 170, 175 milliseconds to get to Seattle, which when you're dealing with like file shares and things can get really annoying, you know, that latency. And so I was, one day, once I'd improved my bandwidth, I was like, right, what can I do to, to fix my latency, you know? So I just sort of sat down. I did physics um, as, a, as a degree. That's where, what, what I'm based in. So I just did some, you know, back of the envelopes kind of um, calculations. And I was just working it out. How, does, how, do, how do I talk to Seattle? I must use satellites, right? So I just looked it up and I was like, geostationary orbit for the nearest satellite, for the Astra or Sky satellite is about 36,000 kilometers. Um, speed of light is roughly about 300, um, sorry, but which is return distance about 72,000 kilometers. Speed of light is 300 million meters per second. Bit calculation, you can check the maths. The actual shortest time by the laws of physics, Captain, is 236 milliseconds if my signal's going off a geostationary satellite and back. I was like, huh. Maybe 175 milliseconds actually isn't that bad. You know what I mean? I'm beating NASA. This is awesome. So how, how, how does my signal get from where I am over to Seattle? And so, you know, if you look on the globe and if you actually measure, it turns out the shortest route between um, Belfast and uh, Seattle is to actually head towards Greenland and keep on going, you know, because it turns out the world's round, despite what people who support the president in America might think. <laughs> And um, so the shortest distance is 15,000 kilometers. The speed of light, again, at 300 million meters per second. Therefore, the actual, by the laws of physics, the shortest I could get my ping time to, even if I took all the routers out and all the hardware out, between here and, and Seattle, the absolute, by the laws of physics, is 50 milliseconds, which is, you know, it's not, I'm not that far off. I'm three times the fastest it could possibly, by the law of physics, get there. And that's the speed of light in a vacuum as well. So, you know, um, I'm actually not doing too bad with my 175 milliseconds. So I, was, I actually shut up then. And I was like, OK, maybe it's not too bad. And first world problems, I've got 50 meg bandwidth. For most people, you know, whatever. Um, I started then, you know, being a nerd, as we all are. I then obviously couldn't let this topic go now. And now I had to understand, OK, 
Maybe that's because of where my signal's going. So then I started doing trace routes and you see that the signal for my internet, it, it goes to the local three tower, which takes like 40 milliseconds to get onto the internet, which is fascinating. And then it goes routing round. It magically goes through a big router near Bletchley Park. I've no idea why that happens. And then goes along through the internet and goes over, it goes through another router over in Virginia near the NSA. Again, no idea why that happens. And then goes across and goes across to America, which is amazing. We do have a fiber optic cable that connects from Coleraine over into New York, but the Hibernian cable, and it runs round. And I was, I've been searching round for an ISP that'll actually let me buy bandwidth on the Hibernian cable so I can get a few seconds off my, uh, my ping time. Turned out it was really expensive, so I, I knocked that one on the head. Um, yeah, so if, any, if, you, if you're interested in this, read a book called Tubes, which is a fascinating book, which really explains how the physical internet works. And it also shows you how these big cloud providers, you know, like Microsoft and Amazon, Google and Facebook, how much investment they're putting in to have, to be able to be the cloud. The cloud is just a fancy name for lots of shipping containers containing computers in a car park in Dublin and then lots of bandwidth, basically. That's all the cloud is. And uh, we have a lot of bandwidth. And there's even, like, while we own fiber optic cables, individual, like, strands of cable between here and America to connect data centers up, Microsoft are in the process of laying their own cable on the ocean between America. And this is how insane, like, this is how, inve how much investment these big cloud companies are putting into their networks. It's fascinating read. As you came in today, you might have walked through the Botanic Gardens, just around the corner. And if you're in the Botanic Gardens, there's that statue that sits there that's a bit strange looking and you sort of look at it. That's of Kelvin, Lord Kelvin. Now, Lord Kelvin is a, a Belfast-born native, went on to the University of Glasgow and was actually, he's the hero of our story. Um, he's, he, he's a developer as well, so in, in this story, but he's, he's the hero of our story. He did a lot of fundamental research. When you see these old Victorians like Lord Kelvin, you always think of, you know, what, what does he do? He invent like Kelvin temperature scales, you know? What's that useful for? It's useful for measuring down to absolute zero, which is handy to know what the temperature is on a night out in Belfast. But it's also, uh, like, what else did he do? He did a lot of thermodynamics. He was a physicist. I like to think of him as the father of DevOps. One of his most famous quotes was, to measure is to learn, which I think is all DevOps is, really. It's about continually getting better, continually deploying into production and then measuring how you're doing and repeating and incrementally getting better as quickly as possible. When you see these Victorians, you see them all old guys, you know, white beards. This is him in a room very similar to this, really, just, you know, slightly different projector. Um, and this is how you see them. But that's when they were famous, when they made their money. Actually, when they were building all this stuff, when they were changing the world and doing their revolutions, they were, you know, young guys, young people. And this is, this is uh, William Thompson is what he was really called before he did all his stuff which made him famous and rich. And that's when he became a lord, when Queen Victoria made him a lord, made him Lord Kelvin. So William Thompson, born in Belfast, that's him there. Got some great mutton chops. A guy, you know, a guy, uh, yeah, he'd be proud of those sorts of things. Um, this is him just sitting around. This is him checking his email, you know. They, they were relatively, apart from actually wearing suits, which none of us do now, the cool people anyway, um, he was just a normal guy, uh, just very, very clever. A young guy out to change the world. What did he do to change the world? Well, he connected the entire world with telegraph cable. The, the whole loop. He invented the technology from which allowed Queen Victoria to be able to rule the entire empire using telegraphy. And by 1890, the entire of the British Empire, apart from um, like the Falklands and Fiji and British Honduras, apart from some really remote islands, the entire British Empire was connected at the speed of light. And this was such a huge revolution that had happened when it used to take months for messages to go back and forth from different parts of the empire. And it, was, it enabled the empire to be able to do what it did, to be able to do the trading and to be able to keep on to power. The telegraph itself wasn't invented that much sooner. The very first telegraph was invented electric telegraph. There was, the word telegraph predates even this, you know, it comes from sort of beacons and people doing semaphore on towers and things. 
But the, the first electric telegraph was from 1837, the Cook and Wheatstone telegraph. And originally, um, it was six wires that we'd use, and they basically had some needles. And when you connected the wires, the needles would point to a character, and that would tell you which, what character of the alphabet you were talking to, which is fascinating. Um, obviously, not very efficient, because you need six wires. You need six conductors to keep on working. And so it was, you know, uh, it was, there was space for optimization there. So a guy called Samuel Morse came along and invented Morse code, you know, and then he was able to do with just one copper pair, he was able to come along and um, uh, still be able to communicate using an international standard code, which you recognise, and it was Morse code. Now, interestingly, if you dig into Morse code, again, being a nerd, there's a whole lot of amusing things you can do there. They had text speak back in Morse code days, and they had emojis. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the emoji for lol in Morse code. Uh, that's lol, there you go, which is ha, you know. So well, that's what we used to say when they, were, when they were laughing. Because the telegraph operators, when they weren't sending messages, they used to chat to each other, and it was a big IRC channel because they were all connected to the same wire. And so they would all jump on the wire and just have, you know, and just have fun and talk to each other. The telegraph was used to revolutionise not just business, but also warfare. This man, Abraham Lincoln, was the first commander-in-chief because he was able to actually command his troops on the very front line from in Washington. He installed the first telegraph station in the White House to be able to talk to his colonels when fighting the American Civil War. Before then, he used to have to run down to the telegraph office and get stuff because he was that, you know, he was, he was into modern technology. He's like the, the Barack Obama of the Civil War era, you know, when Barack was the first one to use a smartphone kind of thing. Now we should probably take smartphones off presidents, but there we go. Um, so during the Civil War, and he used to string up cables and run around, and these would be the very front line would be like two guys running with a, a, a cable of wire like to the front line to establish communications. The generals hated this, of course, because, you know, they used to be able to just go along and, like, sit around and go, oh, yeah, it's going brilliant, and they'd just be sat there having a cup of tea or, you know, drinking whiskey or whatever, smoking cigars. And they got really annoyed because now they're being micromanaged from Washington and somebody's there, you know, are you done yet? Are you done yet? You know, where are you? I'm in Louisiana. No, you're not. I'm, I'm talking to the guy in Louisiana and you're not there yet. Hurry up, you know. But he also used it to send supplies and things and make sure and just be able to coordinate a, a massive battle and that's also where they invented submarine telegraphy and the technology to be able to connect wires together and to be able to go under under large bodies of water when you look at the first submarine telegraph cable it looks much like a standard electrical cable that you would see today but bearing in mind this is 18 you know 1850 1860 they didn't have plastic like what do we use for insulators? So this, this thing here, what do we use to actually insulate the copper wire? Well, it turns out on a British island, we had this amazing stuff called gutta percha. It was like a form of rubber, and it was the perfect stuff for insulating copper wires. And so, but it only grew on this one island, and there was one company in the empire that had the monopoly on gutta percha. And they, they you know, ruthlessly built on top of that monopoly and went and produced loads of cables to do uh, underwater wires. And this was the Gutta Percha Cable Company. Now, after a while, the Gutta Percha Cable Company, you know, Marconi came along, who was also a local guy. And um, despite the Italian sounding name, he was up in Ballycastle and down south and places like that. He did a lot of his early experiments here. He invented wireless uh, telegraphy. And so the Gutta Percha Cable Company diversified, went into wireless, and then they became cable and wireless. That's where that company comes from, from Gutta, having a monopoly on Gutta Percha. So the problem of the Atlantic Telegraph, we want to connect New York with London, again, driven by the banks, as these things always are. We want to connect these major financial centres. The closest direct line is about 3,500 miles, or... Um, yeah, about, what does it say, 5,500 kilometres. The person who raised other venture capital for this was a man called Cyrus Field, um, an American, um, and then he partnered up with William Thompson, who was the scientist. So he's the business guy, William Thompson's the scientist, to try and figure out how to solve this problem. 
Now, they looked at a couple of different ways of doing it. The first way they thought about doing it was to do overland, overland all the way up north, go across a shorter bit of sea over to Greenland, over to Iceland, down through the Hebrides or whatever, and down through some islands, Orkneys, is it? I can't remember. And then down into Scotland and then down. That was the first way they looked at. Turns out that's really, really cold. And what's the thing that you need when you're trying to put telegraph wires up? Is telegraph poles. There are no trees. And so they were putting things on top of piles of rocks and stuff like that, and people were dying and it didn't go very well. So that was the first option they thought about. The next option, which was surprisingly favoured by the French, was to go via a nice tropical island down and then um, go over and then go over into the Bay of Biscay. That was where they thought it might work. Again, a fairly short route, uh, nice weather, you know, rather than cold, uh, but it, it was a lot longer underwater route. Another option was to take some of the cable overland, then combine that with an underwater cable, a submarine cable, and then have more overland part from Newfoundland to Valentina Bay, which is just on the south tip of Ireland. And this actually was the most complicated route because it involved both overland engineering and submarine engineering. And so it seemed the most complicated way, but there was a couple of reasons why this is how they ended up doing it. One, they actually went and did some fundamental research, they did some science, did some depth soundings, and they found out there is a nice, this bit here isn't too deep, and the, the currents are not too bad, it just is like the Goldilocks zone. And they still call it today, it's the telegraphic plane on the Atlantic Ocean, because it's just this bit that's not too deep, it's fairly level, it turns out it's great for laying cables across. This way gets very, very deep and there's all sorts of things. The reason why these Azores exist as a volcanic outcrop is because there's volcanoes underwater. Volcanoes and wires don't mix, yeah? And then up here, it's really cold. Again, Iceland, pretty volcanic. And it's very deep and very jaggy. And so they decided to go along this telegraphic plane. The other reason they broke the, this down is because it allowed them to be more agile. By doing this, when, while they were building the overland routes, they actually would send out steamers to meet the boats who were on this shipping lane between the UK and America. So they would send out fast steamers to meet the shipping boat and pick up the messages halfway across. And so they managed to cut down the time it sent to send a message from London to New York was 14 days on the very, very, very fastest steamer. By put, having this overland route in here, they were able to knock five days off this journey. So get it down to, you know, it was around 10 days actually by the time the steamer gets back and things. But that was a huge, that was a third, you know, that was a massive improvement, but it was an incremental improvement, but it still helped them really uh, get better. Then the first Atlantic cable came along, so the first try, and this is a classic engineer-driven exercise. This is the first bit of cable. I should warn you now, by the way, I'm a bit of a nerd about this topic, if I haven't already mentioned it, if you haven't already noticed. Uh, this is me on my office doing a video. Uh, on the wall there, if you have a quick look, we zoom in and enhance on a very CSI to start my to start transition. I have a piece of this cable in my office just over there and, and a letter signed by Cypress Field saying that's the original piece in a map and stuff. So I'm a little bit, new. I got a little bit obsessed about this topic, I'll admit. So what, what they did with the 1858 cable is Cyrus Fields talked to, um, uh, talked to William Thompson and asked, how do we build the cable? We, 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 they specified the cable, they did it in a very waterfall approach, they built the cable, they then split the cable into two boats, because no boat's big enough to carry that much cable, you know, no boat in the world can, can carry that much. So they split it into two boats, one, the HMS Agamemnon, uh, which they filled, again, look, sails and stuff, this is, you know, this is old technology. Um, filled the HMS Agamemnon, and then the other one that the American Navy provided, the USS Niagara, filled it for boats. They met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and they connected the wires, and then they sailed apart. And they went, carried on going, and dropped the cable off at each end. Now, it was a great journey. It was just, you know, the ops guys left on their own, rolling out this cable. They, you know, it was rolling around. They had a great time. They got to see whales. They got to drink lots of rum. And then they got connected at each end, and then it was handed over to the, to the again, the live site team to actually run the cable now. Uh, Lord Kelvin, by this time, was, was kept away from, and it wasn't, wasn't allowed to talk to these people, um, even though he wanted to. So it was handed over to the, to the operations team. 
Um, and there's huge celebrations because this was revolutionised, you know, the world. We can now talk at the speed of light between London and New York and it was just amazing. So the big parties, lots of champagne and then they tried to send the message from Queen Victoria to President Buchanan and it took 17 hours for the message to get sent. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it was all slurry. There was a bit of speculation in the press that maybe the Americans had been drinking too much champagne at the other end and couldn't hear us. Turns out, when you, it was a, it was a breakdown from the people who were running the system to the people who'd invented the system. The people running it didn't understand how it worked. And if you take a big long wire and roll it out, it acts very much like a capacitor. A capacitor is just basically a big long wire. There were capacitors, when, you know, one of those things. A big long wire curled up into an insulator and then put into a cap. If you try and send a message down a capacitor, it has certain effects, and that's, that's what happens on the cable. The guys running this didn't know it. So they're trying to send a message, and it starts, starts blurring and getting slurry, and they can't quite understand. So what does a British person do when he's talking to a foreigner and they don't understand him? They shout louder, yeah? So we put more and more voltage down this cable. Come on, come on, you stupid Americans. Listen to me. I'm British. I'm English. You should be able to hear me. And blew up the cable. So this massive expense model of the modern age, they just blew it up under the ocean. Oops. Then there was a thing called the American Civil War, which kind of kept everybody busy for a little while. Uh, so then they started again in 1865 with the post-war cable. There was actually two, but we'll talk about the main one. And they came in, and now engineering's moved on. Look at the size of that. That's a, that's a big cable, you know what I mean? That's a massive cable. They, so they built this three and a half, or five and a half thousand kilometres of cable. The problem with it was the weight was about the same as like 3,000 elephants. It's a big cable. As I said before, nobody could carry the old cable. What's going to happen with this one? Well, it just so happens around that same time, a guy called Isambard King and Brunel was on a wacky mission, a Kickstarter-funded crazy thing, to go build the biggest boat ever made, the biggest boat ever seen, the Great Eastern. It was six times bigger than anything anybody had ever seen before. It was ginormous. It was a massive paddle steamer. Uh, it's the biggest machine ever built until that time. You know, it was skyscrapers, but laid out uh, and made of iron. So, problem is, while it was an awesome ship and a technological marvel and great for the resume, uh, it had no use to anybody, because like, it was made of steel, had no portholes really. It didn't, nobody could really knew what to do with it. And so 1865 comes around, isn't God, Kingdom Brunel has this massive great big boat nobody knows what to do with. Luckily, it can carry the cable and the coal and the pigs and the sheep that they need to be able to get all the way over. So that's what they did. They filled it full of wire and then they took it and rather than doing the whole tying two bits of wire and going across and just seeing if it worked, what they did with the Great Eastern, because they could fit all the wire onto one boat, they actually took the Great Eastern from Valentina Bay and they put the ops people on the boat. They had the dev and ops together on the boat. And so now um, uh, William Thompson was there with the actual people who were laying the cable. And as they were laying the cable, they were continuously testing. And so they were talking back to Valentina Bay the whole time. You know, you, how far are you now? Well, I'm, I'm just around the corner, you know, and a bit further. Can you hear me still? Can you hear me? It's a bit like starting a video call, you know. Um, so yeah, and they basically sat there and they were able to just listen as they were going the whole way. Which led to a, a and you can, this is great, I love this picture, because there's William Thompson there, there's, Cyrus, there's William Thompson with his sideburns, there's uh, Cyrus Fields, there's people testing the cable. These guys, these are obviously managers, you know what I mean? They're sat around, <laughs> smoking, are you done yet? Uh, this guy's armless, <laughs> there we go. Right then. But it was, it was a fascinating thing that this ended up happening, because if you think about Concorde breaking the sound barrier, this ship was actually breaking the information barrier. Behind this ship was a wire connecting them back to London. The, the, when you read the London Illustrated Times and the papers of the day, which I have at home, again, a little bit obsessed, um, you, can, you can actually read all the excitement about how they're progressing on the journey, the whales they've seen, you know, is reported daily. 
In America, they didn't know it was coming. This is a picture when it landed, and they were like, it landed out of the fog, and they're like, whoa, the boat's here, because they were travelling faster than the speed of information. The information was getting to London, and it couldn't get back in time. And so they arrived ahead of the wake of information, and they went, whoa, what's going on? And so once they connected it, they were able to transmit information at the speed of light now between London and New York, which was amazing. And again, lots of celebrations. It was the amazing you know, technical marvel of the modern era. And they didn't stop from there. They went and added new cables. They connected the entire globe. And that helped the empire become what it did. Um, obviously, what do you do when you invent this amazing technical marvel of communication? Well, they used it for online gaming. Yeah. They played a telegraph chess match between the, you know, the House of Commons and the, uh, the House of uh, Representatives in America. Uh, the Americans won, surprisingly, which, which the British were outraged about, obviously. But uh, yeah, it was, so the online gaming was invented in 1866, which is hilarious. Um, so if we compare nowadays the technology from the, 1850, the 1858 cable at home, and this is an example of a modern uh, submarine cable, You'd see the engineering has not really changed that much. You know, you've still got lots of big wires, big wires. Conductor. And the only difference is the conductor here is copper, and the information carrier here now is glass, it's fibre optics. That's the major difference that's happened, technologically speaking. Obviously, these changes have led to massive increases in bandwidth, which leads to the internet, which then the internet has led to the open source revolution that we've got today. The first cable, remember I said it took 17 hours to transmit that first message. It was around about 0.1 words a minute in Morse code. The 1866, 1865 cable um, had a speed, operational speed of around 1.3 bits per second, if you translate it, you know, from telegraphic code into, into uh, binary. It was only until the 20th century when we got that up to 120 words per minute. Or, uh, or, or 20 bits per second, you know, so the changes from, from during the 1860 era up until the 20th century, in terms of bandwidth, didn't really increase that much. And then in 1901 was the first telegraphic message get. Now we have gigabits of bandwidth connecting us, you know, we take it just for granted that we can download movies off Netflix and things. But even in, at the start of, the, the start of this, you know, century, the um, 100, 120 words per minute, it's amazing. Right, so what's this got to do with anything? Okay, it's a cool story. Uh, here's the tenuous link to what this has got to do with what we're here for today. Okay, um, we're, the reason why we do what we do is because we live on the edge of chaos. And a lot of people who work in IT projects will recognise that term because uh, that, that describes our life. But that's a deliberate thing that we're trying to do. And this, was, this is a, a visualisation that Ken Schwaber did in the original Scrum Thinking books and the Agile books. If we've got technology where you know, understand the technology and you understand the requirements, what it needs to do, we don't build those things, we buy those things, we build them off the shelf. If you're building something where the, the requirements are known and the technology is known, i.e. an email system or whatever, don't build it, buy it. You know? or, or if you're outside, if it's slightly more complicated in the complicated zone, then maybe you need to integrate a couple of solutions together. Now, the other extreme, and I'm sure we've all worked on these projects, is where the requirements are far from agreement, you know, and the technology is completely unknown, right? And that, that lies chaos, that's failure, okay? We, for our businesses, we're always trying to skirt the edge of chaos in, this, like, in, the, in, the, in the complex zone. That's where we live, deliberately. And we, we deliberately live there because that's where we get customer value. That's how we, that's how we you know, give value to the people we're building stuff for. So we're, we're living on this, this edge of chaos. And you want to make sure you're doing that. And you also want to make sure you're using management styles, techniques, you're working together in a team in a way that's suitable for living on the edge of chaos. It's not, it's not building a bridge, it's not engineering, it's people living on the edge of chaos deliberately for fun and to make most money. And we need to make sure we're being agile so we can change our requirements as we go along. We need to make sure we've got the dev and the ops team working together. We need to work incrementally and we need to do all those things, not because they're cool, and Agile's awesome. The reason why it works is because we're deliberately living on the edge of chaos. 
These are the takeaways I've got for you today. First of all, let's understand, like, it feels like we're in this amazing period of political instability, well, maybe, and we're also in this amazing period of technological change, definitely. But this technological change isn't new. Like, in, 18, in 1850, they'd never... They, it took a month to get a message back and forth to New York. By the end of the decade, it was at the speed of light. And that didn't just affect messages, that completely affect, revolutionised markets, that completely disrupted industries, and that disrupted empires as well. Um, whenever you're doing a problem that seems completely insurmountable, the Victorian moonshot, as this was, try and break it down into small incremental improvements. How can you make it better while you're heading towards your North Star solution so you can still get customer value and then be able to give that customer value out to people. Obviously, get your dev and ops teams working together on the same team. Don't just hand things over, throw them over the wall. You need to work together and own that solution. And then finally, well not quite finally, exploit the edge of chaos. That's what we need to do. And then finally, we need to go ahead, we need to plan, we need to learn, and then we need to plan to learn as we go along. And we need to plan to learn as we are doing today, which is why you're here. So thank you very much for coming and learning from everybody here. And then finally, I'll leave you with this quote from Kelvin, again, a, a very, very, very clever chap from Belfast who revolutionised the world, just like you can be revolutionising the world today. And his favourite quote was, to live among friends is the primary source of happiness. So I see some familiar faces here today. It's great to see some friends. I'm looking forward to making some new ones. But thank you very much for coming. And uh, have a good conference. Thanks very much. Nope. Thanks very much for that, Martin. Um, our next speaker is Paddy Carey, who will be talking about microservices, from monolith to microservices, and back again twice. So he'll be up for the next five, ten minutes. So please get around for that. Go, go, go and find a talk about something about nothing you've ever heard of before and learn something. Um, everything else is going to come in second, third, fourth, fourth. Sorry, second, fourth. Is that interesting enough? Is that